in this august seat of learning i'm bound to say universities are an incredible way to learn about materials and an in-depth academic route is very often a primary means to gain what what you might term a material literacy however i'm going to talk about how we use materials in the making of sculpture one of the great things about sculpture is it can be made almost anywhere and with almost anything uh, we at Pangolin have specialised in the making of bronzes and other cast sculptures and although we just started out as one couple in a shed and a homemade greenhouse, we have grown somewhat. So perhaps I'll start with a very speedy flying visit around the foundry to give you an idea of where and how we operate. So, hope you don't get too dizzy, <laughs> but it's a big space so... It needs to be quick. So we flew a drone around the foundry in order to uh, not disturb anyone as we went round, recording everything that's going on. All the different uh, departments. <coughs> different technologies we use for casting some very traditional some much more contemporary and lots and lots of research and development go on into basic basically every every sculptor brings something brand new and we have to sort of reinvent the process for all the different languages that sculptors use so although the basic principle remains fairly similar, we have to continually adapt it and change it so that, we, so that we cast in the most appropriate way. There isn't just one way to cast. We have to um, vary the techniques and how we might use them in order to best interpret the work of the artist. It's a little bit... I always think it's a little bit like an orchestra interpreting the music of a composer. So the composer has got the music in their mind, they can notate it down, and then depending which orchestra they work with, it will always sound a little bit different. The emphases will be different, the colour, the tone. And it's a little bit like that with a foundry, not as, not as um, free perhaps. And the other similarity is of course We've got a huge team of people and uh, they all become incredibly skilled in their own particular field. Quite a bit of modern technology as well. 3D printers, computer programs, virtual reality. These are things that artists are increasingly wanting to use and so we have had to adapt are very traditional techniques, some of which go back to our third great technology. After stone flints and pottery comes the Bronze Age, and um, we still we still use we still use that process in a simpler way as it was done 6,000 years ago. But we've also changed it a great deal as well. Okay, so that's the foundry. As you can see, it's a very large team of highly skilled people and a vast space devoted entirely to the creation of sculpture, sculpture in all its diversity. There was a time when the genre was restricted to stone, mostly marble, wood or bronze, possibly accepting the primary materials of clay or plaster. However, that has long not been the case. Sculpture now incorporates a dizzying variety of materials and the forms these materials inhabit have become equally diverse. In a parallel evolution, sculpture foundries that traditionally only moulded and reproduced pre-made forms by the sculptor's own hand has changed way beyond any of the 19th and early 20th century founders like Rudier or Hebra would recognise. 
I think part of the success that Pangolin has enjoyed over its 35-year history has, I believe, something to do with the visual richness of our backgrounds and our early exposure to practical experiences with the forms and materials, and that facilitated an uninhibited relationship to the stuff of art. Both Claude and I were exposed in our tropical African childhoods to a fantastic range of natural forms, from jellyfish to whales and seeds to skulls. And these weren't just visual experiences, they were haptic ones as well. So shapes, forms, fragments, textures, we would collect, we would draw them, construct them, mold them, display them. Um, simple experiments with molten lead poured into seashells or candle wax painted over dead fish or reptiles as a primitive mold and then cast into plaster were part game but they were also part serious endeavour and the exciting magic of transformation through a captivating process. Both of us drew a great deal as a means of really observing something but also as a means of thinking in a non-verbal visual way. So I think I first um, realized that looking at the enormous diversity of African art, that masks are basically all made from one material, and they're all basically one subject, the human face. And an important penny drop for me then, um, that art can be made from anything, and that a restricted subject or material needn't be an expressive limitation. Indeed, I believe it's what you do within the limitations that creates some of the best sculpture. Now, the attraction of bronze casting, which was on the one hand a legal way to play with fire, was actually so much more. It meant teamwork. You can't really bronze cast on your own. It's an amazing way of transforming objects using skillful and exciting processes and sumptuous and sensuous materials. And it involved us intimately with some of the most interesting people in the world, artists. These men and women actually create our culture. They articulate what it means to be alive in the world now in beautiful, poetic, sometimes shocking, but always relevant and emotional ways. And in the foundry, we have the privilege of helping them create the, per the permanent monuments to our age. So our early inspiration from nature, the process that continues today, of course, becomes a visual library in our minds of sculptural forms, textures, and patterns. And these are actually really quite important for understanding forms and materials that artists want to use. So skeletons, fur, beaks, skulls, scales, bone, that's bone too, uh, shells, eggs, bony plates, rock crystal formations, uh, and fossils, to show you just a very few. Uh, are collected, not just physically, but also as images and surfaces in our mind. And it becomes like a lexicon of materials and forms. Uh, it's an intuitive assembly, um, but it becomes like our own personal encyclopedia of material objects. Now, all this visual stimulus needs alloying with technique. So once we'd built a place to do the molding, waxing, casting, metalwork and patination, it then becomes routine to become really proficient, to reach a point where we could abandon the recipes and the charts, the proportions and the temperatures, and to know just by the feel and the look of the substances that we use that they are right. I remember vividly as a child watching a builder putty in a, plane of, a pane of glass into a window. That shows how old I am. Uh, and uh, it was so beautiful, just one, one movement, a flick of a wrist, and he produced a perfect, chamfered, smooth, functional surface. That looks easy, I thought. So I tried. Uh, I'm afraid my attempt was catastrophic. The putty curled up behind the knife and fell to the earth into a useless waste of effort and material. But 
the good thing about craft is persistence pays off and competing as a team with one another um, skills do get mastered and at that point thinking becomes not about what you need to do with your hands but an exploration of what new combinations can be found with process, substance, and skill. This is where craft really becomes exciting. Now, uh, a big part of being um, a team means that you have to impart skills to others, and that's crucial, um, because as the team has grown, uh, you've, we've seen people develop and it's one of the great joys of the foundry, seeing the sheer skills that the craftsmen and women who work there um, are in control of. Effortless, instinctive ability. They make it look easy, just like the builder in his window. Uh, new skills constantly need developing as we respond to the requirements of the sculptors. And so we've created or welcomed many new trades to complement our original ones engineering, kiln and furnace construction, spray painting, goldsmithing, specialist welding, scanning, virtual reality, digital processes, to name but a few. So I'm now going to show you a few of um, the processes involved. So here we've got um, mold making, mixing the rubber. Again, you'll most of the materials for making sculpture are wonderful materials in their own right. This is silicon rubber, and you can make a terrible mess with it, but once you get skilled with it, it actually becomes a very beautiful material to use, as well as the most appropriate material for the job. This is wax, molten wax, being painted into the mold, and as you can see, it's... Um, very neatly, carefully done. Obviously, once you get a wax out of its mold, you've got to work on the seam, the seam line where the, the mold parts joined. And this calls for um, great sensitivity because no two sculptures are going to be the same. And each time you work on the surface, you've got to match the work of the artist. What we're doing here is putting a system of wax tubes onto the surface of the sculpture that will feed the metal into it. And now we're painting a plaster mix onto the surface and building up a solid block mold. Teamwork, skill, material. So that's almost that's an almost finished mold. This is the molds after firing we fire the molds to evacuate the wax from the mold and then they need strengthening so this is that process playing with fire again and this is the molten metal beautiful orange color This is a different process. This is ceramic shell casting, where we dip the wax on, in a framework into a slurry, um, a ceramic slurry, and we then dip it into an aggregate dust of fused silica, and we continue that process 13 times to build up a shell all around the wax, which we will then bake the wax out of. These are the molds coming out of the kiln and we can pour the metal into the hot virtual space in the shape of a sculpture with a, with a molten bronze. Here we go again. It is quite addictive, that catharsis in the middle of the process of the molten metal um, once you've got them out, you may have to work on the surface. You can see the head has been cast separately and needs to be welded to, together on that. And you have to remake any tech, just like, as you do in the wax. So it is, it is highly skilled interpreting 
the marks and surfaces of the sculptor's hand. So this is all metalwork. We use a lot of hand tools. We make a lot of our own tools for punching in textures or chiseling, chiseling out pieces from deep crevices. But all the time being faithful to the surface of the artist. This is patination, which is the final colouring of a bronze. If, it, if it's not going to be painted, then it's usually oxidised with metallic salts. And as the metallic salts oxidise onto the bronze, they produce a colour. And um, we've developed quite, a, quite a, a list of recipes of different colours that we can put onto bronze. It was um, when, we were, when we were starting the foundry, we were rather worried that all our clients were rather old and um, that the processes weren't going to attract new sculptors and we thought that colour might be something to introduce to for, for sculptors. And so we put a lot of research and development into creating new patinas and, uh, and it worked. It brought us lots and lots of new contemporary artists. Um, alongside other developments, we've had to um, develop with the, the modern technologies of scanning, 3D printing, even virtual reality. So this little video shows some of the, some of the processes that we um, have adapted to the making of sculpture. Um, so from the scan we can then make models from which we can work out the angles and sizes of sheets of metal that we can then either guillotine out or have um, cut. Um, outside and then we can assemble the sculpture as a result. So this is Lynn Chadwick's beast in stainless steel um, and this is the scanning of a tree. So we are actually scanning a tree. Um, we're using drones, we're using um, photogrammetry off the drones and on, and on foot and we're also using a, a, a much bigger scanner for getting the general shape of it. We'll simplify it in the making of the sculpture afterwards, but we wanted the real data of the real tree. So that's what's going on here. Once we've captured the data, we can start, after, after processing it in the computers, we can then actually start printing it or milling pieces out of foam. So this is, this is the process going on at the moment. Uh, photogrammetry is very good for capturing expression or movement. And we've built, in conjunction with our neighbor, who is a specialist art photographer, a 160 camera photogrammetry rig, which means we can put a person in that rig and record them absolutely. So this is Heather's face recorded, and we're building a sort of um, ornate crown on the on top of her head, uh, entirely in um, different programs, um, 3D modeling programs. So it's a snapshot into what goes on. Obviously, this might take a few days rather than the seconds that it, it's going on at the moment. But it gives you an idea of some of the possibilities. And with all these processes, we look on the digital processes as an analogy for the physical processes that we could do by hand. It's just for certain things the computers may be more appropriate or more desired by the artists. So um, we have to have that option and we've had to teach ourselves lots of skills that we didn't have before. But because of the analogies with, with physical modeling, it hasn't been that difficult for us to adapt. Okay, so um, a very sad job we had to do was last year the very last male <coughs> northern white rhino was dying and we were asked if we could go out and record him with the idea of making a virtual reality rhino seeing as the reality was no longer there. So this is us recording him with a white light scanner. The thing I'm holding that looks a bit like an iron is actually emitting beams of light which uh, it can record bouncing back. We also recorded him um, in photogrammetry but using a single camera and we then brought that data back um, to the studio and started trying to recompose him but because he was alive because he was moving 
a lot of uh, the data wouldn't go back together. It was like a jigsaw puzzle that wouldn't quite fit together. So what we did is we modeled an anatomical body of the rhino and then used the digital skin that we had captured to put it back on. And we then decided to 3D print him at life size. And this is um, a, a, a short video showing you how it how it's done. So our 3D printers print these sort of square blocks that you see all around. And we literally built him onto a skeleton made of polystyrene, cut to shape. Um, and it was literally like tiling the bathroom, except with a bit, of, a bit more artistic grouting, if you like. Um, so you can see this is part, you can still see the squares of each 3D print. And in the back, in his back legs, you can see the structure that holds the whole thing together. So this is Marcus, one of our physical modelers working on the surface, because we wanted to put in a real, hyper real surface. We wanted it to almost feel like him, so that when you, when you do experience him in virtual reality, it will be like having him there. It's just he won't be moving. Um, it's quite interesting in a parallel development uh, scientists are working very hard uh, using um, the sperm of this now. Um, well, it's almost extinct. There are two females that, that remain, and they've been harvesting eggs. And in vitro fertilization has just been achieved for two eggs. So hopefully we aren't just a very destructive species. Hopefully our creativity can also possibly rescue this species from extinction. But um, it was a very poignant use of some of the skills that we've got to create a, uh, a monument, if you like, to our own destructive and creative nature. So we use scanning quite a bit. This is scanning uh, a rock face in the Crimea. Uh, that was for a sculpture monument um, to Mary Seacole. And um, uh, so we've, we've used it for that. Anyway, I hope you can sense that there is a joyous aspect to all of this, despite the fact that it remains hard work. I like to tell the team, if you aren't enjoying it, you're doing it wrong. Um, anyway, trying to encourage recalcitrant materials to go into the incredible shapes, forms and images that artists dream up is almost always challenging. So it's really useful to remember the fundamentals of casting. At its simplest level, it is the manipulation of materials that have both a solid and liquid state. So a typical form will go solid, the original, liquid rubber, solid rubber, liquid wax, solid wax, liquid plaster, solid plaster, liquid wax melted out, liquid bronze, solid bronze. And the other nature is of positive and negative. We start with a positive, we make a negative mold, positive wax, negative the fired out mold, and the final positive finished bronze. It really is as simple as that. <laughs> so um, I'll now talk you through a few of the projects that we have done and tell you a little bit about how they've been made. So this is the 160 camera rig. That's a real person dressed up as Ayrton Senna in his racing gear and replicating him going round a corner of a particular racetrack on a particular race. Um, that then led to this bronze, the finished life-size bronze, and there's also a smaller one, and this is us patinating it, um, um, a sort of greyish colour. Um, we also work on quite a large scale. I'm sorry, this is a terrible image, um, but this was 14 enormous um, sculptures based on the development of the baby inside the womb. It is positioned outside a mother and baby hospital in Qatar, um, this is one of the baby's faces, so you get an idea of the scale of it. It, um, it ended up weighing 216 tonnes. We did approximately 19 kilometres of welding to put all the pieces together, and much of that was in Qatar, in, in a shed. Um, this is in America, a sort of highly detailed, life-size um, sculpture of a grizzly bear, their, their emblem. And you can see the level of detail that bronze is capable of um, reproducing. This is 
um, a very tall bronze uh, position down in Ilfracombe. It's by an artist who's got a, quite a lot of work out in the streets here. I'm sure you all know him, um, a son of the city. Um, we still make um, uh, monuments to all sorts of things. This is the monument to um, Betjeman in St Pancras, the, the Victorian station that he saved from destruction. Um, we don't just cast sculpture, we fabricate sculpture. This is a mobile by Lynn Chadwick, the very last sculpture um, made in his life, um, and uh, is stainless steel. It's beguilingly simple, um, and although it's a rather regressive form, as it turns in the wind, it's in immensely sensuous and very beautiful. Um, this is another artist who you will know from Leeds originally, Kenneth Armitage. And this was his final sculpture called Reach for the Stars, uh, 30 foot tall. Um, he actually died as we stood it up for the first time um, in a very sad moment. Uh, this is um, Sarah Lucas's first bronze sculpture. It's a life-size Shire horse. I'm sure you can all recognize its origins from the little porcelain and wooden um, ornaments that decorate many of our um, homes or grandparents' homes. Um, and she got us to make it life-size. It's all bronze except the two large marrows in the cart, which are cast concrete. Eduardo Palazzi's Vulcan, you may all have seen in Yorkshire. Um, it's there at the moment. And um, uh, again, a very, a very interesting and um, empowering artist to work with. Um, this is Michael Jew, an American Korean artist with his um, polished raised stripes on, it, on the zebra. We get asked to do some quite interesting things. This is a skull of a crocodile uh, cast in silver. Uh, the original one we had to go to Ethiopia to mold in a remote um, rural museum. Um, it was a large, the, the largest Nile crocodile, and it had drowned in some fishing nets. Uh, but it, all its teeth had been stolen, so the artist wanted us to recreate the teeth. Um, and to do that, we had to mould the skull in Ethiopia, um, leave, it th leave the skull there. And we found another crocodile skull that we moulded the teeth of, but it was from a much smaller crocodile. So we had to do crocodile dentistry in the computers and printed 3D printed the, the teeth and then fitted them into the skull at the right size. Um, this is an artist called Michael Cooper who carves in stone basically and he likes his bronzes to have something of the feel of stone so patinas and surfaces are um, worked on. It's quite useful because the same chemicals that colour bronze are the same ones that give stone its colour so it's, it's also a primary source of research for us imitating um, the mineral colours in stone and finding ways to do that. Um, this is Jonathan Yeo creating his self-portrait in virtual reality, um, which we successfully managed to print and then cast into bronze. Some of you may have seen that in the Royal Academy. Um, these are 25 foot tall aluminium sculptures by Geoffrey Clark. Again, his last his last realized sculpture uh, just before he died. Um, he liked working with the lost polystyrene method, which um, amazingly didn't kill him young, uh, because you literally ram sand around polystyrene and pour molten metal on top of it to vaporize the polystyrene. I, I can assure you it's not recommended on any health and safety manuals. Uh, produces very horrible smoke, but it did make for a very beautiful sculpture, and it was very important to him that we did use his method to cast it. So that's what we did. Um, this is a very large sculpture that we made for Mark Quinn that resides in Norway in the middle of a river. Um, it's actually a scan of his client's eye that we have given every color a slightly different um, height to the surface, creating a sort of relief sculpture, and we had to get the river to flow through the middle of it. So that was quite an adventure. This is, uh, uh, again, 20, 20 foot tall piece by Yayoi Kusama, and um, all the, it's cast aluminium, 
but with uh, a paint painted surface. So it's painted just like cars are painted with um, stencils and spray paint. Very large sculpture needs pretty serious engineering to hold it up. This is the armature in stainless steel pipe, very thick stainless steel pipe that will hold up a sculpture that is 60 foot tall and 50 tons in weight. You can see it's all been designed to come apart at various flanged points and we can unbolt it. Uh, the sculpture is way too big to um, transport in one, one section, so it's divided into seven. We transport it in seven pieces with the bronze skin attached to the relevant bit of the armature, and we assemble it on site, including welding and patination. Um, well, this is Huma Baba working on the final bronze surface of her receiver sculpture that you have in Wakefield not far away. There are a few images of it going through the foundry, so this is uh, the wax of half of it. That's the same piece being cleaned. That's it having been washed off, cleaning out the inside. It's very important the inside is free of any of the material that we use to get the bronze in there because that would rot the sculpture from the inside. And there she is in all her glory. Uh, other view. And that's the team. So I hope I may have shown through our particular experience that some form of material literacy can come from empirical rather than academic or theoretical pursuit. I'm not suggesting it's the best or only route uh, uh, by any means, but I think learning through making uh, can be a very original source of creative development, and in my case, certainly the most enjoyable. Thank you.